Hello and welcome to Food Systems, a podcast from the Forum for the Future of Agriculture, where we discuss ideas that can shape a sustainable food system, from farm to fork, from policy to consumers, and everything in between. I'm your host, Robert de Graff, and you can find us on Twitter at Forum for Ag. These episodes will be available every other week on all major podcast platforms. Before we get started, we would like to say a quick thank you to the FFA founding partners, the European Landowners Organization and Syngenta, as well as the FFA strategic partners, Cargill, the Nature Conservancy, Thought for Food and the World Wildlife Fund. Please enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome back to Food Systems. Today we're talking to Marc Rosier. He's the Managing Director of MR Food and Agriculture Consulting and has a long personal history in both agriculture and the functioning of, a, of the food chain. Marc, thank you very much for joining us today. The pleasure is also on my side. Thank you. Uh, I want to start off with something that we've discussed with a number of uh, previous guests on this podcast, which is the sort of what appears to be quite a central contradiction. Farmers want a good living and preferably high prices for their products, but consumers and the food chain would prefer to pay less for the same product because that impacts their standard of living. Is this a contradiction that you think that can be resolved? It's certainly a contradiction. Uh, if it can res- be resolved, that's another question. The market already plays a very central role in the European Union's agricultural policy today. And I think tomorrow this will not be different. Um, Supply will increasingly be driven by demand. And that's what we see already. eh? The Commission of European Union in its regulation is uh, retrieving from, uh, from from the market and the market is gaining importance. So we see much more increased price volatility and also depressed agricultural prices uh, in the European Union. Uh, Why is this so? Uh, There are different uh, reasons in my opinion. Uh, First of all, uh, the price as a signal uh, for equilibrating um, supply and market and demand is not really uh, playing its, its role. And uh, why is this? Uh, the first explanation you can find in the, um, in the uh, characteristics of, of uh, farming, because uh, farming is confronted, and I, I look at livestock, with long production cycles. If a farmer decides today, to grow, uh, to to raise uh, cattle, uh, it's only available two, three years uh, later. It's also, uh, these cycles is all also influenced by the climate. The longer the production cycles, the slower the reaction time to shocks in demand. And then the climate uh, adds uh, additional complexi- complexity uh, to the systems. Another explanation uh, lies, in my opinion, in the great lack of permanent systematic and correct information on both supply and demand to which the farmers can gear their individual production decisions. So there are so many farmers and only quite centralized decision centers uh, downstream, but all those farmers, they uh, they have to find individually to find the, 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 the market signals and and this is not very well coordinated. And so as a consequence, what do we see? We see uh, lots of shocks in supply because demand is quite steady, but there are lots of shocks in supply. So that means that uh, at a certain moment there is oversupply, and when there is oversupply, it's a lesson from the first year in the university, then you have low prices. When there is short of supply, you have high prices. So at the whole uh, system to equilibrate this demand uh, to uh, the supply shocks is, is quite uh, a challenge. Moreover, I put aside this whole problem of uh, characteristics of uh, agriculture, the, supply, you have also, of course, the price level as such. In fact, it's also uh, depressed. Normally, you should, at, you should, you should expect, expect that uh, the price level in Europe is equal to um, the world market price, SIF, like they call it, uh, cost insurance freight, plus the remaining border protection. I explained, so you got the world market price, you put the tariff on that, and that should be the internal price. Uh, but that's not the case. In quite a lot of countries, you see that this is uh, not at all the case. So there is there is an uh, an issue on price level. So that means that there are other forces working that depress the price under this uh, re- normal theoretical European uh, price reference. 
what are the answers? Because that's in fact the situation and how can we solve this? Um, uh, I think there are a number of ways to go and that's also this way that the European Commission is going. The first way is that of course, we have to uh, swipe before our own door. What we have been doing for years, cost efficiency and so on, we are obliged to continue to search for uh, economies of scale, to search for uh, more um, cost efficient uh, production. So we have to look for scale and scope benefits. Scale, of okay, that's uh, cost efficiency. Scope, it's diversification in, uh, in quality and all those type of uh, strategies. Another element that can be, and that has been very successful in the past is of course, storage export or alternative use of surpluses. Those are in fact the classical ways that agriculture or the, the food chain has been responding to those uh, supply uh, shock. Uh, I give the examples in the food sector. We put uh, the apples and the pears, which are harvested in the, in the harvest season, we put them in the, in the cold storage, and then we can uh, use them later on. Cattle, uh, pigs, they, they call them some uh, we, we call them uh, sometimes uh, walking walking cereals. In fact, cereals, food, or storage in in pigs and so on. And that okay, that's in fact the way agriculture agriculture and farming has tried to find solution to these uh, uh, shocks in supply. A second answer, and that's where very recently, or the last seven, eight, two years, yeah, the Senium, uh, the Commission is very, working very hard on, is strengthening the position of the agriculture producer in the chain. Um, I explained already, there are millions of farmers. Uh, when you look uh, downstream, uh, you see the numbers of companies, processors are much more, uh, uh, at much uh, lower. And you see to the retails it even um, more concentrated. So one of the elements of important um, element to try to solve this together with swiping for your own, do own door is strengthening the position of the agriculture producer in the food supply chain. And there, the, I must say, already in 2013, 2020, so the actual, the actual common agricultural policy, there is a whole chapter on uh, producer organizations, branch organizations, which were before the, um, the 2013 period uh, only uh, developed uh, in, within the food uh, and vegetable sector. Uh, this whole concept of producer organizations and uh, branch organization has been, like I call it, horizontalized. That means they opened it up for all the sectors. So now in all agricultural sectors, you can create producer organizations or you can create branch organizations. What are the purposes of those two types of um, uh, organizations? First of all, producer organizations, farmers get access to economies of scale or scope together they can negotiate better supply conditions and prices. They can exchange best practices. They can invest um, in sustainable farming tools, in risk management tools. Uh, for instance, when you want to start hedging for cereals, if you do it only with the volume of a farm, you cannot get access to those tools. When you group this uh, volume into uh, a cooperative, you can uh, recruits a specialist in hedging and you can hedge much more and um, bigger volumes. Investing in common equipment, uh, investing in storage and, and other facilities. They can develop uh, specific offers, uh, quality differentiation uh, strategies and so on and so on and so on. If they take the form of a cooperative uh, legal form with respect of the autonomy of the individual farm, because it's very important. Uh, farmers always think, uh, uh, quite often think uh, binary. That means uh, an all or nothing story, but you can cooperate very easily on one aspect in, um, in farming and you don't have, do not have to uh, bring in or to uh, lose your autonomy on all the other aspects of farming. This way, by doing that, a producer organization can play a very important role in uh, supporting viable farm or, or income. There is only one important sideback, and that's the governance. The larger the cooperative, the more difficult the governance, because in a cooperative, each person has one vote. I do not have to explain if you have an interaction between 3000 people, it's more difficult to manage an interaction between two people. So the governance is in fact the side pack of cooperatives and you see it everywhere in throughout Europe when uh, a cooperative is not working well, it's quite often almost for more than 70% you can find as the reason a lack of governance.
because they are now much more on stronger European legal footing than they were before. Is this a movement that you will expect to grow in the coming five or 10 years or is it difficult to say? No, I think it will grow. Why? Because uh, cooperatives uh, and slash producer organizations, uh, they uh, receive exemptions on competition law. So um, normally a competition law uh, prohibits that uh, companies which are active in the same sector exchange information amongst each other. So normally a farmer cannot exchange prices and volumes with its colleague. But if a farmer is uh, participating in a producer organization, within the producer organization, they can exchange. That's one of the major, in my opinion, one of the major drivers why um, it is still interesting for farmers to regroup uh, in producer organization because once they are organized, then they can, and that's the second element, then they can uh, enter into dedicated supply chain, which, uh, and I mean by that, they can enter a direct relationship with a retailer or a direct relationship with a processor, uh, because uh, typically retailers and certainly um, what they call second transformation processors are not directly interested to uh, develop uh, relationships between um, them and individual farmers, but they are quite well interested to develop relationships with organized farmers. But what, what would prevent a, a farmer's cooperative from simply beginning, beginning their own factories or production sites for secondary transformations or even going up to the consumers themselves? Do, do, do they need to have intermediaries still? I think uh, everybody has to remain in his own uh, competence. I think the, the retail competence is different from secondary transform processing competence, is different from primary primary. There you can see that there you see a lot of cooperatives that I, for instance, all the, the dairy cooperatives, okay, they, they, they conservate uh, their milk. And you see that uh, certainly in a number of countries uh, that even the cooperative model is dominating uh, the, uh, the first transformation, first processing. But the other, when you go farther away from, um, from agriculture and you come more um, uh, closer to the consumer, I think that's another way of thinking. Yeah, you can imagine that a cooperative is acquiring and recruiting people who know this business or acquiring companies or acquiring a retailer, but I didn't see this yet at the moment. I see more the reverse, that uh, a number of uh, retailers are establishing dedicated supply in order to, to say to their clients, your food is coming from there, there and there, and it's produced in this and this way. And okay, when they do it in a, in a dedicated supply chain with respect the autonomy of all the different partners, I think this can work very well. And uh, it is uh, part of uh, the solution of depressed prices uh, because in preferential uh, supply chain, you know each other as partner and you uh, eliminate a lot, of, a lot of leakages which are available in, um, in change where all the different parties are not linked to each other and they have to compete on a horizontal level with each other. So a lot of leakages, when those leakages are uh, eliminated, when you um, create dedicated supplies. Uh, and that can be done in, in different, you can have uh, with a retailer, for instance, you can develop different uh, dedicated supplies next one to another. You can have one in beef, you can have one in pork, you can have one in, uh, in poultry, you can have one in uh, baked uh, cereals and so on and so on. So you can have a, a, a lot of things, but once you are in a dedicated supply, the fact you know it's other, the leakages are not present anymore. A lot of retailers, uh, they will not change their buying price, their purchasing price, uh, and everything, all the leakages you can, uh, you can uh, get rid of. In fact, it, this, those will add to the net income of the farmer. Instead of doing a different set of interactions with the supply chain, more farmers should take it over themselves and sell directly to consumers, very short supply chains, uh, farm shops, online business models. Is this something that you see growing in the future? Is Will that always be a, a limited niche market? Uh, this will, I think, and certainly Corona has uh, shown there the way, of path the way. Uh, this will certainly remain as a business model because I want to underline also, agriculture is not only one business model. There are different business models that live beside one another. So that's uh, not an issue. And I think the short chain or the short supply chain is certainly a uh, type of uh, business model that will remain because um, people, uh, I, local is becoming very uh, dominant, very important. In Europe, there are about uh, seven or eight regions 
which are in a net export position. The short supply chain will not be a solution for uh, regions which are within the European context in a net export position. Because uh, one, one example, uh, the pig meat, for instance, we only consume 15% of the production in Belgium. So all the rest goes to uh, our fellow countries in the European Union. So those, those are by, per definition not a uh, short supply chain. Yeah, you can't buy directly. But on the other hand, we speak a lot about shortening supply chain. And then we come back to the dedicated supply. By shortening, you can eliminate a number of uh, intermediaries. And I come again to my proposition and you stop the leakages and you can have more um, of the income that remains within this uh, dedicated supply. And then it's a question of uh, the right um, distribution. If you want to continue your dedicated supply, uh, everybody knows that each partner has to gain, otherwise he will leave. I believe very strongly in those uh, way of um, approach. And you see already that quite a lot of uh, companies, uh, not only retailers, but also processes are looking for this type of cooperation. Returning to the issue of price, one of the things that's been talked about more and more is whether or not we should shift to a what is known as a true price model, where we where in the retail price or, or the supply chain prices fully reflect not just the production costs and the margin of profit, but also the environmental externalities. Is this something, do you think it's possible to, to move globally or within Europe to a true price model for agriculture? From a theoretical point of view, it's a marvelous concept, but uh, there are a lot of uh, barriers, I think, practical barriers to implement. Uh, first of all, I think about um, the import uh, leakage. Uh, what are you going to do with um, the imported goods? Uh, is Europe, will Europe be able to impose this type of uh, calculation also on imported goods? Uh, big question marks. And secondly, uh, when um, food prices increase, even in the rich Europe, uh, the affordability of food is, is an issue. When you look back to the, the treaty, European treaty, uh, affordable prices is one of the key objectives of the common agriculture policy. And it's still there. After all the changes and all the uh, reforms, this objective is still central objective of the common agriculture policy, affordable prices. So um, I think when you even double the prices and double the prices, it's even it's at, at the farm level, it's, uh, it would be the solution. And for the consumer, for the average consumer, probably not a big issue. It will be a very, very big issue for a lot of people who are below the line, let's say. Even if you can put it on a practical way in, um, in operation, you need to have an accompany uh, measures uh, of social redistribution uh, to help uh, people to, to buy the necessary food. Uh, theoretically, it's the most, uh, most common sense system, let's say, the most equitable system, the most just system. I compare it also very often with um, the non-trade concerns the European Union defended at the WTO uh, table all the time. Okay, we imply, uh, we put a lot of non-trade concerns in our uh, on the table in those in those uh, at those ad in those agendas, but at the end, I I was present uh, once in um, in one of a meeting, and then the Indian Minister of uh, Agriculture of Trade he said very simply, in my country people are dying in the street. Oh, we do not speak about environment. We want to solve first that problem before we speak about environment. Today we will not say this anymore. I think with the whole climate uh, change issues, which are really uh, very dominant. In fact, it's an illustration of the same the same uh, problem. Uh, theoretical concepts can be very fine and very nice, but uh, on the practical level, it's. Uh, not that easy to implement. As you just said, there's a lot of urgency now within the, the climate debate. Does do things like carbon storage, biodiversity promotion, will they be, do you think, a source of additional farm income or will they just mainly end up becoming another cost center for farmers to take care of or something that will, or that will have to be paid for through public subsidy? In my opinion, for the first time now, uh, there is an opportunity for farmers to get rewarded for what they call today eco uh, services and carbon is in fact leading this uh, this way the opportunity is there now we have to see that the opportunity is translated in real uh, real rewards for the farmers um, and there are uh, a number of uh, barriers of course that have to be taken and there is also I I, I say um, normally there are I say quite frequently recently there are a number of birds in the air 10 birds in the air but, but you only catch two or three yet and so we need to catch the other seven 
uh, before we can really have speak about the system. Uh, what I can indicate a number of those those barriers. Uh, for instance, um, first of all, the European Commission developed with its green architecture a set of uh, uh, I translated the, the subsidy rules into a new set which will normally support this type of uh, activities. The increased conditionality, so uh, the baseline for all the farmers will be increased without payment. That's uh, that's a pity. But then they installed so the eco schemes in the eco schemes in pillar one which are ob obligatory uh, at um, member state level, but voluntary at farmers level. There you can get, a farmer can get access to, for, for instance, carbon farming uh, schemes or precision farming schemes or uh, um, agroecologic schemes, um, which uh, when he follows uh, those standards, when he follows uh, those tools, he can get additional money. And then, of course, in pillar two, uh, the uh, environmental um, agri agricultural environmental measures uh, are still remain in, will still remain in place. New uh, new measures be um, uh, allocated uh, to this uh, basket. And uh, okay, there. The, so the finance is there. Will they be there? Okay, the, the member states are developing the national strategic plans. Uh, they will uh, be, have to be introduced by the thirty first of December of this year. Commission will be reviewing this uh, beginning next year, and so they will be implemented from the 1st of January 2023. Um, but okay, this will come, and there will be uh, money available to for the farmers to go uh, to make this transition. But my feeling is that this will not be enough. So it should be complemented by private money. Uh, and private money, then, okay, uh, we are talking, there's a lot of talks about carbon credits. But before you can get to a credit, you need to certify all the practices that the farming is doing before you can issue a credit. Eh? Because issuing a credit is the same as issuing new money. And when you speak about new money, you speak about trust. And now in this case, in carbon credits, the trust has to be given by the robustness of the mechanism that verifies that what the farming is doing is also delivering the uh, storage of additional CO2. This has to be put in place. This is not yet being put in place. Uh, commission will issue a number of criteria to recognize future, uh, to, uh, future standards. But first of all, those standards have to be developed. It's not only by giving, uh, by indicating some uh, eco schemes that standards are developed. Standards have to be developed by private initiative by farmers associations together with uh, processors associations by individual companies but those standards have to be developed and uh, we are not there yet uh, so um, this is only one element um, i see that still has to be done once that your carbon certificate is there then of course you have to develop the market where you can trade it and there i'm a little bit more optimistic because you see today that there is more demand for uh, carbon credits than there is supply. So I think once the supply will be organized and um, the re relevant um, regulatory framework is put in place, uh, the market will follow. Eh? When you see the, the compulsory market, the compliance market on the EDS, uh, European trading system, you see that uh, the, the credits are traded at the moment uh, around um, 40, 45, 50 euros uh, it's a ton, uh, CO2 ton equivalent. In the voluntary market, it's only between 6 and 10. But what you see already is that both curves are growing exponentially and growing together. So that means that it's really demand pool. So we need to organize the supply to get, to get enough uh, certificates in place so that we can fulfill demand. And everything that you see now in what the Commission is uh, launching, even the, the climate, uh, the fit for 55% of the uh, Commissioner um, Timbermans, um, there you see very clearly that everything is pushing towards uh, that way of thinking. And then carbon is the only, that's in fact, is pulling all the rest, eh? uh, all the other ecoservices, because behind carbon are a lot of co-benefits, which are more difficult to monetize. Uh, which are, for instance, better water management, soil fertility, soil health, uh, biodiversity, uh, less nutrient leakage, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. Carbon will pull this. This will also be discounted further on in the value of a carbon certificate.
if you if you look at the way this market is developing now, uh, we've reached we've really just seen the latest IPCC report, which made for some very bleak reading. Uh, if I'm honest, do you think that this market development will be quick enough to really make a substantial difference in terms of the CO2 emissions and the storage we can do? Or is it too late and too slow? I must be optimistic. <laughs> so I think, no, yeah, if you are pessimistic, then you can better start to say, okay, I put the light off and uh, bury me and it's finished. So we have to be positive and say and, and, uh, and put everything in um, in place so that it can work. And if everybody does this, then we can get to the ambitions uh, which are stated by the European Commission. So um, that will be my, my answer to that question. Uh, we cannot be, I, I think there is no time to lose. Um, uh, what IPP, the last IP, IPCC report said is uh, really alarming. Uh, I think we can't, I, I think all the guys who are still doubting, I think this is not finished. Uh, we have now to work and I think we introduced the carbon farming project. We spoke with a lot of farmers already. There is willingness to do, but we have to come with, of course, with realistic uh, proposal because that's still one of the other barriers. There are a lot of techniques that farmers can use, but today we do not know exactly what's the impact on carbon or on income of a certain technique. On the other hand, the commission is asking for result-based. Yeah, okay, but if you do not know what could be the result even in a, in a, in, within, within, between two limits, why should you sign? That's a blanco check. So there, there is still a lot of work to be done to calculate uh, and to accompany uh, new measures with the, cal the calculation of what's the impact on my income and the impact on biodiversity, all the other objectives that the European Commission wants to do. Because some of the measures are even uh, counterproductive. If you do a little bit too much of that, you get too little of the other. I'm not an agronomist. I'm an economist. In agronomy and in the soil, there are also equilibria to respect. And uh, this is also very important and um, to continue to research. And that, of course, when you look this and you put this further on, Commission is putting also a lot of effort on independent advice. All these elements should come then in independent advice and accompany farmers to do it. And there is still, that's, uh, it's still uh, quite, that are still birds that are flying around, which should be captured and put into place uh, before uh, the puzzle uh, will be will working. We've gone a little bit longer than usual, but it's a very interesting conversation. But I wanted to close off with the same question that we ask everybody who comes on the podcast, which is if you could give one policy idea or a practical suggestion that would really make a difference and create a more sustainable food system, what would it be? One of the specifics, uh, specific proposals the, the Commission is doing is to create an AFOLU sector. What's the AFOLU sector? They want to integrate agriculture forestry and land use in one regulation. In fact, what they want to do, they want to reconnect what's happening in the soil with what is happening above the soil. And I think that's essential to get all the noses in the right direction, the foresters, the farmers, uh, nature managers. This is how they, they, they are also using the land and their activity using the land has the impact on what the, what's happening below. For the moment, the Commission only plans to integrate this from 2030. And by 2000, 2035, this combination has to be climate neutral. And from 2036, they have to become to help all the other sectors that cannot compensate on their own to compensate CO2 emissions. Um, perhaps it's, um, it's, I think it's already an ambitious uh, goal, but um, I think if it can, could be stepped up, it would help a lot. Marc Roger, Managing Director of MR Food and Agriculture Consulting. Thank you so much for joining Food Systems today. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me. You've been listening to an episode of Food Systems, a podcast brought to you by the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. Look for us in two weeks when we release our new episode. And in the meantime, please don't forget to subscribe on your podcast app as well as on Twitter, at Forum Fag, for updates on this podcast, news, as well as FFA events. Please check out our website, www.forumforagriculture.com for more great content. Thank you for listening and enjoy your day.